welcome, Chris. Uh, I am uh, Sean Demensik. I'm a member of the American Solidarity Party. I'm filling in um, for everyone uh, see, seeing that Zeb was going to be moderating the schedule, filling in for him uh, because he's participating in the convention. Um, I am uh, a member of the party as of uh, several years now, a member of the Catholic Worker Movement as well here in Lancaster, PA. And uh, I'm really excited to be interviewing you, uh, Chris. Chris Arnady is uh, here today, um, author of uh, Dignity, um, a very famous book of yours. And um, I'd like you maybe just to uh, introduce yourself um, for those who maybe haven't heard of you before. All right. Well, thank you. And I'm glad to be here. Um, yeah, I um, have a, this is my, being a writer and photographer is my fourth career. My other three was, um, I was an academic. I, I got a PhD in physics and then I ended up going to Wall Street where I actually worked for 30, 25 years, 20 years, sorry, 20 years. Um, so have you ever seen um, uh, Liars Poker or, or The Big Short? That was basically me. Um, and uh, um, one of my, um, passions in life was photography and walking and so um i spent um <clears throat> three or four years basically walking during while i was at my job walking all over new york taking pictures in, in neighborhoods you're not supposed to go to as a banker um basically poor neighborhoods places where you would have catholic worker houses <laughs> um and uh i both with my photography and then eventually writing the stories of people i heard i ended up um basically quitting my job and spending my my the next 10 years, um, spending time in communities that are, quote, left behind, poor communities, um, um, places that people tell you not to go to, and, um, and uh, writing about, basically um, taking photos of and then and writing the stories of people who, who were kind enough to talk to me, um, homeless, addicted addicts, um, or just, you know, working class people trying to get by, um, and uh, I ended up putting that into the book dignity which is you know again tries to formalize what what, what i found in these neighborhoods um but um you know was was both a a desire for dignity dignity despite rough circumstances a desire for dignity and how how hard it is to maintain dignity in the current environment um how hard we've made it for people to to live dignified lives even though they they strive for that and often achieve it how hard that is and so one of the things I kind of, I guess, to some degree, I got kind of, to some degree, notoriety for was um, I, I started kind of looking at the political environment and I said, what, what I think we have here is um, we have a lot of divisions in this country, but the one I think we talk less about than we should um, is the division of education. Um, what, you know, what I was finding in these communities, and I went to communities that were poor black communities, poor white communities, poor Latino communities, um, or Somali communities. Um, I was finding, despite the obvious differences, um, that there were a lot more similarities than there were differences. And what was similar was, by and large, all these groups that was spending time were, had been, quote, um, were basically people I call the back row. And I don't mean that derogatory in a derogatory way. I just mean it as, a, as a descriptive as people, you know, in the classroom analogy, they were the ones who didn't necessarily get the attention they deserved, didn't necessarily um, want to be there. It wasn't an environment for them. And so much of our culture these days is built around that education. And, and I contrasted that with, you know, what I think is easier to define, which is the front row, which is in, you know, the, the people who spend their life building a resume and a career, the people I worked with on, in, in both, both in academics and in Wall Street. Um, and so my thesis was to some degree, you know, to be somewhat provocative that um you know the the bond traders i spent time with a republican bond trader has more in common with a call you know a cornell professor who's on the left than either of them do to you know a truck driver or a kid flipping hamburgers or the people mm -hmm. who I, I was spending time with and that the divide in our country is more about education um, than it is about as, as much as anything else Mm -hmm. And so I kind of came up with a framework back row, front row um, for that. Um, and I think, again, the easier thing to understand is the front row. I think we, we, you know, you know the front row when you see it. It's the people who generally run our political systems. Mm -hmm. It's the people who run our CEOs. It's, you know, professors. Um, it's, it, you know, 
and again, I don't mean this in a derogatory way. I and mean, a lot of the front rows are very well intended, um, but you know they're the they're the ones who generally run the system, the the, the country politically, um, and so um, they they tend consequently to not necessarily um, uh, really understand the people you know who are, make up the bulk of the country, which is the back row. Yeah, I appreciate that um, that metaphor for thinking about things. I mean, obviously, the main divide we can kind of think about is this, uh, you know, uh, you know, the sort of conservative liberal divide. And then there's also this, you know, certain divide. You know, people talk about things in terms of, you know, uh, the, you know, the one percent, the ninety nine percent. But the front row, there's there's a lot of people. I would I would hazard a guess that many people watching this now would be in front row America. Um, and, you know, like you said, it's, uh, you know, can be kind of broad and it's, uh, you know, who it includes. Something I, I like about the metaphor that really works is that, you know, the front row um, can't, you know, they're, they're watching the show, they're right there, you know, watching the show and they, you know, just by nature, you know, the back row sees the front row, front row isn't pointed in that direction, you know, they're not, they're not looking at the people in the back row. And so I think there's so commonly on both sides of the spectrum, there's these kind of framings of, you know, what, back row America, what the, the working class, you know, normal Americans really want. You know, you see both like conservative uh, representations of this, you know, that sort of try to speak on behalf of the people, the sort of, you know, populist angle, you know, real honest, you know, working class Americans. And then uh, on the, the sort of liberal side, the same kind of appeal is made, you know, to uh, the American people, um, you know, and, and both of them, you know, is, is these appeals by front row America to, uh, to to, uh, to be working in the name of back row America without really looking at them, without really seeing them, you know, being turned in their direction. Something I appreciate, uh, and I think a lot of people, like what, what has really made your work click with people has been uh, that, that mixture of um, photojournalism and uh, personal storytelling where you go in there and you just, uh, you know, you get actual images of these people and, and the real kind of struggles of their lives without trying to, you know, just kind of hold them up as a poster and, and use them as, as part of, you know, a particular political agenda. Um, that there's a lot of particular differences I'd love to maybe hone in a little bit more on. Uh, COVID would be a really interesting one, voting an interesting one, but maybe just generally, if you could give, for, from all your years of, of your photojournalism, of your conversations um, with these people, uh, with, with the, you know, this huge portion of the American population that is back row America, you mentioned education, but what, what would you boil down as like the essential differences, if there is one that you could you could? I mean, there's to? there's huge differences, and I think it, it you know, it's basically what I call um, it comes down to credentialism. What I think we in the front row all kind of do. I mean, I'm not saying we mean you. I mean, although I do it, I certainly have, um, and I'm sure people listening here do that. And I don't. Again, I don't mean this in a derogatory way. It's just it's descriptive. We, we tend to build resumes for credentialism. Um, and that's kind of our source of meaning, our job. Um, whereas I think in the back row, um, the source of meaning is are, are, what, are a lot more natural. What I call things that are gifted to you by birth with low barriers of entry. Place is, another, is a perfect example. You know, you identify as, um, I'm from Prestonburg, you know, Kentucky. That's yeah. what I am. That's who I am. And that's what matters to me. And that gives me a real a sense, you know, and that, that means more than just, you know, I'm, I'm from Kentucky. It's I, you know, I, I have this legacy and I, I have a community that I'm gifted, that I'm part of, and that I'm integral part of. Um, another one is family, um, you know, extended family, um, same thing. Um, another one is faith. Now, um, you know, that's probably the one that got me the most frust pushback um, from the left, um, you know, where I, where I generally find myself on is that, you know, I went into this project an atheist, you know, and um, I came out of it not an atheist. And um, partly was when I did my project, you know, 10 years driving, going to these communities, I did what anybody should do when you do it the proper project was I didn't just fly in and fly out. I actually spent time in these communities mm -hmm. and that meant doing what they did. So I spent my time in McDonald's, which I became somewhat famous for is the amount of time I spent in McDonald's. But I also went to churches. I went to I went to I went to houses houses of worship all the time, um, almost every you know if I if, and and um, a whole whole wide array of denominations, um, whatever was kind of the dominant 
group or, or, or the group that I was hanging with or wherever I was invited. And, you know, I couldn't come away from it without seeing, quote, you know, to be cliche, the power of faith mm-hmm. and how essential it is. And I don't mean that just in a uh, pragmatic, you know, there's sort of a utilitarian argument that you hear from a lot of kind of the, the, the quote, atheist who turns, who, who acknowledges the role of religion is much more pragmatic of simply saying, well, you know, it works, therefore it's good. No, but it was a little deeper than that. It's much more meaningful than that. It's not just a pragmatic utilitarian tool that helps them get by. It's who they are. It's, 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 it's a real sense of importance. Um, and um, and um, so these kind of, these kind of ways of, of forming your identity um, or, I mean, are just, are just kind of very foreign to the front row. Mm-hmm. Um, to the degree we understand them, you know, we either study them like I did, like, oh, look, that person's religious. I wonder what that means. Let's mm-hmm. do a, you know, let's, let's put together a table of how religion affects other things. Yeah. So it's very much like a specimen to be studied or, um, or it's um, something to be mocked, you know, mm-hmm. and, and to move on from. Like we've, we have to get beyond provincialism, you know, is, is when they see someone who's, set, who's proud to be from Kentucky or proud to be from Detroit, we have to get beyond provincialism. We have to get beyond pay place. We, we need to be atomized people who move, move around the globe and, you know, um, or family is this, you know, this, this outdated mode that we need to move beyond. Mm-hmm. Um, and faith certainly is, you know, there, there's a, there's a wider range of, you know, uh, of people who, who, who are, Kind of the the front row is is uniformly secular. Not necessarily, you know. They may go to church, you know, to check the box, but it's not. It doesn't inform their worldview. It doesn't inform how they approach approach the world. Um, and um, you know, I, I often give you the example of if you're in the front row and you, you have a new problem that comes to you, something happens, uh, your life changes. You know, um, for instance, I got Bell's palsy as an example. I just got Bell's palsy. That's something new. So what, like, what you tend to do when you're in the front row when you when something like that happens, like, oh no, <laughs> you you run off to the library. Ah, I'm going to go study. I'm going to find the experts. I'm going to become a specialist on blank. You know, um, there's a you know there's a new problem we we have to solve. Um, off to the library and to the experts. That's great. That's what I do. Um, but on the back row, it's a lot more. Um, you know, you pray um you you it's a lot more um a lot more intuitive you use your experiential set to say well hmm how should i approach this um so there, there's this really different way of thinking about the world um and what your role in that world is um you know in the front row your role in the world and it, 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 it amazes me to, to how how people don't even understand people who are in the front row who are extraordinarily smart people very bright, very great people still don't necessarily know they have a worldview. <laughs> mm-hmm. They just don't question it. Like, uh, it's careerism. Uh, I'm going to build a resume. What do you mean? Like, you know, uh, any, that's just the way it is. Whereas, you know, there's a lot more, I think there's a lot more intuitive approaches that the back row takes to life. And the problem I have with how the policy class we've created is we, um, we look at the back row. Um, it's fine to have these different forms of meaning: careerism, place, family, all those things. The problem is when when the when when the when the front row runs policy and they only understand one framework, then that becomes very um, disenfranchising to everybody else because there's only one form of meaning that's valid. Mm-hmm. And so you know, so if you look at kind of how. The traditional, the tradition, the left traditionally approaches the back row. Um, you know, they say, well, hmm, the current left, that is not the traditional yeah. left, but the current left, is they say, well, hmm, you just need more education. You need mm-hmm. to, you need, it's not like I want to go understand you and your problems and how I can change to address your worldview. It's no, your worldview is wrong. We're going to intellectually colonize you. You're going to become, we're going to help you become, go to Stanford. We're going to help you go to Princeton. We're going to help you become me. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a very colonial attitude, which is um, we're going to approach the world and we're going to, we're going to, we're going to not going to look at your meaning set. We're going to look at, we're going to take our meaning set and ask you to become part of our meaning set. Mm-hmm. Um, and whereas the right traditional right simply looks at the, well, you know, work harder, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. get a job. Yeah. 
Something um, I'm interested in, in hearing how what you've sort of seen in, in those encounters there is that, um, you know, there's often a sense on the sort of radical left, this idea that, you know, we need to engage the working class and they'll sort of gain a sort of solidarity through, you know, say, uh, you know, worker organizing, and especially like if they see the government helping them, you know, if they see, uh, you know, um, you know, cash being dispersed or welfare programs happening that will endear them to, you know, the, you know, the, the social programs or, you know, the, the socialist state, you know, for, for a sort of, you know, that, that vision of, of the left um, or, or just a social, social welfare state or whatever. Um, and I'm curious, you know, how do, you're describing these different forms of meaning, um, you know, that, that back row America engages with, you know, how does, how does that inform, you know, thoughts about the, say like, you know, a lot of, the, a lot of policies that are pushed are, you know, around, um, you know, providing resources, you know, providing welfare and everything. And there's, a, there's a lot of, uh, yeah, I'm just curious, you know, how do you see welfare interacting with the lives of people either in positive or negative ways? Um, I um, think, yeah, go uh, ahead. I, I mean, I think, one of the things I think we're, we'll talk about eventually, but I can use it here, is the overwhelming political attitude, you know, that I think is not talked about. I think a lot of people talk about the political attitude of the working class, et cetera. But mm -hmm. what I find most frustrating, which isn't talked about, is the degree to which they're just removed from it. Um, and I don't mean that in a direct, I mean, again, uh, you know, they, they view it as something that's happening to them, not something they can affect. Because mm -hmm. all these institutions are cold, sterile institutions that have basically, and excuse my language, screwed them over before. Mm -hmm. So they're they're very very not you know the, the the dominant group of people I met, and, and and it's the biggest it's the biggest political block in the country. It's a non-voter; they don't vote. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I call it justified cynicism. Like if something has has if, you know if you're playing checkers and you keep losing and the, and 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 you keep losing because you think because it's rigged against you, you're going to stop playing. And why, why keep playing? And so they view politics. Now, that's not to say they don't have political opinions. I think that's a very big misunderstanding that someone doesn't vote. Therefore, it's it's that they don't view. I mean, they, they it's kind of like they it's how they view sports. Like, you know, I can root for the team, but I'm not a player. Mm -hmm. So I, I have my I have my I have my views, but no one's going to listen to me anyway. So what's the point? Um, and I think the general view is that this is stuff that happens to them. And most of it's bad. Yeah. Um, the overwhelming experience is it's bad. Anytime you get involved, it burns you. So why am I going to get involved? Um, you get scolded. You get mocked. You end up in jail. <laughs> you end up with big bill. Um, in government, when it does come from the left, and again, I, I'm all for it coming from the left. That's where I stand politically. Mm -hmm. um, it often comes with bureaucracy and tangled mm -hmm. rules and, and it's dehumanizing. Um, and so there's, there's no quote, you know, to use my title, there's no dignity in the, in the process. Um, and so to the degree, I, I'm a huge, one of my, you know, one of the hill I will die on is, is, is helping people. And I treat it like harm reduction, um, helping people, but getting out of the way, like, you know, you know, you can't use food stamps, you know, you can't use SNAP on, on sugary beverages, you know, stop that. Let people mm -hmm. let, you know, stop treating people like, 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 um, like, like, um, like children that need to be basically scolded. Let, let them do what they want. Let, give them the freedom to do what they want with their lives. Mm -hmm. And government should, should, you know, government needs, they don't like government because government has burned them before. So stop, you know, there, there's a, there's, when government works, they love it. You know, social security is a perfect example. Um, you know, Medicaid, when it works, is a perfect example. Like, you know, Medicare is a perfect example. Like government benefits that actually have, like, like the checks, you know, stimulus checks um, that actually come, come with very little bureaucracy, little paperwork and actually hit the bottom line or they love, you know, like, so, Government has to be functional. Mm -hmm. It has to be seen to be on their side. Um, you know, government that comes with a bunch of rules and regulatories and scoldings is just, you know, is, is, it's just one of those things, again, to use a classroom analogy, it's the, it's the dreary institutions that's always treated them like, 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 like you know, losers. 
Mm -hmm. um, so there's no need, no need to no need to get involved. You know, I think the, the modern left, the current left, the, the left of the of the Bill since Bill Clinton mm -hmm. is more and more the front row. You know, yeah, it just is. And so one of there's just there's just a cultural disconnect that you know politics we, we you know we in the front row like to think again politics is you you get these two resumes you get to choose which one to hire i'm going to hire the democratic party i'm going to hire the republican mm -hmm. party that's not how politics works though that's not how you have to you have to activate someone and get them to you know i call it the hangover test are you going to wake up hungover and go vote mm -hmm. like you know 95 percent of the people i met aren't gonna, unless they're really motivated and something's going to come their way and that motivation isn't just a list of policies it's also cultural yeah you, know, you, you you when somebody is scolding you or 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 patronizing you you're mm -hmm. not going to vote for them yeah. you know even 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 if they probably want to help you you know <laughs> like even yeah. if you you know even you agree with a list of policies to the degree you think about them you're not going to run off and vote for somebody who, who generally is just like you know the, the weird kid that comes into the neighborhood and finds your lifestyle icky, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, I mean, you, you can't be, you can't be a banker and be the party of the working class. You just can't, you can't mm -hmm. be, the, I mean, they're, they're just at odds with each other. Yeah. You can't necessarily be, um, you know, I don't think you can be the, I think you might eventually be able to mold a, a academic working class party, but I'm not so sure you can. Uh -huh. um, there's just, you know, not, not in this modern period when I think, um, um, when I think so much of um, when, when over the last 40 years, we've been able to live in these ideological and social and cultural bubbles. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you know, I, I, I don't think a lot of the people, a lot of, I don't think, you know, I think there's a lot of activists on the left who I, I love, but they, they're not the activists on the left I grew up with when, in, in the 70s, mm -hmm. who actually were as comfortable in the union hall, who actually lived in these neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, they're removed from these neighborhoods and that's bad. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much to talk about there. And I, I'd love to dig into like three different points. Um, so just, just to go off in one thing that I'd love to hear you expand on. You know, you mentioned um, that scolding is incredibly unattractive to back row America. And honestly, I think, you know, it, it's, you know, unattractive to, to a lot of people in front row America as well, although maybe not to, not to all of it. And, but, um, you know, on that point, I think there's two issues that come to mind when, when we think about scolding in this past year, um, you know, from, from this point looking back is, you know, on, you know, we've, we've had, you know, COVID has really dominated the lives of most people. It's, I think, probably one of the things that people have really felt um, politically and, and socially. And um, the other thing, uh, you know, that up until the election was really dominating the discourse in our lives was Black Lives Matter, both as a, uh, a you know, activist movement out in the streets and, and for many of us in cities, you know, very active, you know, at certain flashpoints in those places. And then, of course, culturally, you know, has been all over the news, whether you're uh, for or against it or whatever kind of spin you're giving on it. So, um, you know, I, I'd be interested in, you know, how does, uh, I, I think from from my point of view, it seems like a lot of the, um, you know, the, the, the left or, you know, the, the liberal wing of U.S. politics uh, whether or not there's, they have, you know, good intentions or good policies or, or some truth to what they're saying, that scolding is a really, uh, that, that, that just, a, you know, that's what comes to mind when I think about COVID, when I think about um, the liberal presentation of Black Lives Matter, scolding is just a, a good way of describing that kind of politics. So I'm wondering, how does that, um, you know, how, how has that resonated with, um, you know, people and, and why does that, you know, uh, affect them and, and how could you know uh, I would I would guess that you know you think that there's and I wouldn't disagree with you you know there are issues around uh, public health and racial justice that need to be addressed um, and that needed to be addressed in this past year but how could that have been done in a way that doesn't come across as scolding you know what, what would that even look like well I mean it would, it would, it would first and foremost come from people who weren't removed from your community right, right. And, and, and let's, I mean, let's go with COVID first, because I think okay. that's the easier one to handle and, and, and less sensitive. But, um, you know, COVID should have, you know, if there's ever been a, a, a case where 
where we should have um, dropped, you know, some, some you, after, after, you know, after the election for Trump, um, there was a lot of, and, and again, in this election, there was a lot of language of like, you know, well, the Democrats won um, um, the uh, economically, um, you know, the, the, the part of the country that produces 75% of the GDP. Mm -hmm. you know, um, and uh, that was the argument after after um, Trump Trump won um, the electoral college, but Hillary won the um, popular vote. Well, it was made the case was made that you know, well, look, you know, the Democrats are the party of the economically, you know, or of the makers, mm -hmm. and it's really the Republican, you know, you know, which, which is so offensive on many levels. But one of the things I would hope, you know, because one of the things is like you know, no no play, every place is is diverse. You know, you go to you go to the blue estates, and there's red 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 regions, and you go to the red estates, and there's you know, Mississippi has has a one the largest African American population. You know, so um, yeah. you know, the red estate has has the largest uh, Democratic base, and so, um, but COVID should have you know made us aware that there are people, the front row largely, um, can sit in their room and um, and work from home. Mm -hmm. and have delivery people take the risk for them, provide them their safety, their food, their energy. Those, those people, you know, are people, people who, who provide the safety, you know, the police and the, and the military, people who provide the food, you know, people working in meat packing plants, you know, should, if, it, if it's, you know, And, and grow our food, um, and the people who make keep the power lines going. Um, you know, these are all places that that if there's ever been a an illustration of how the front row needs the back row, and mm -hmm. who literally risk their lives to, to allow them to work in their homes. And you know, so you know, this should have been it. COVID should have been the case where we stopped the discussion about there's one part of the country that takes, there's another part of the country that makes. Um, but it didn't. Um, and you know, All of a sudden, when COVID hit, house prices here went up by thirty-five percent. You know, the Lowe's was was out of deep freezers because because the rich people were coming up here buying houses and getting the third deep freezer, so they would never have to. You know, compared to my friends who were in the Bronx, living in the fifth floor walk up with three generations sharing one bathroom, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the, as I as I point out, we have something called the laundromat gap. You know, there are people who can't isolated place they have to go to the laundromat and i think it's like you know uh i don't know what percentage of the country uses laundromats but almost 100 percent of the people i know do yeah. so yeah. you know how we how we think about these issues how we talk about them just you know just shelter in place well that's really easy if your place is a mansion that's really hard if your place is a fifth floor walk up of mm -hmm. three generations living there or a trailer park in west virginia so um you know covid should have allowed and and yet and yet during covid these differences that were were, were illustrated and the, the wealth gap the um you know the income gap the um the luxury gap the, the laundromat gap all these things we we still saw the front row basically you know driving policy and forcing the back row to and and you know forcing them to literally risk their lives to to serve them you know, and so that should have put some things in perspective. But unfortunately, I think we still came. In, we still, you still have this sense that, you know, why aren't these? Why are these people still out there doing things? You know, <laughs> mm -hmm. why aren't they doing what I'm doing, which is, you know, doing whatever, whatever the CDC says at the particular time. Um, in terms of Black Lives Matter, like Black Lives Matter, I have a lot more sympathy with that movement, um, and I think, you know, one of the things I always have written is. I spent more time in black communities, poor black communities, than I did in poor white communities. Because um, mm -hmm. my project was as much, you know, I spent three years in the South Bronx. Um, you know, I, 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 a lot of my time was spent in neighborhoods where, you know, uh, I stood out because I was the only white person. Mm -hmm. um, and I only say that because 
you know, what's always what's always kind of struck me in these neighborhoods is how, you know, I'm always surprised. Um, they, you know, the the anger doesn't bubble bubble over more often. Hmm. Um, you know, it's um, there's a palatable sense of cynicism, and there's a pal you know, there's a palatable sense of justified cynicism. Um, you know, I, I wrote a piece called you know, libertarianism for me, authoritarianism for you. Um, you know, the, the, the front row um, has created a policy class of libertarianism where we, 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 we basically strip rules away from businesses um, under, the, uh, under the philosophical idea that, you know, um, um, that, you know, that individual liberty at a business level is, is, the, is the most creative and the most, but, but then we, we also do, you know, a stop and frisk and, win, and, and broken windows, which is effectively authoritarianism for the poor people. Mm -hmm. And you see this, you know, you see this in, in poor, poor, poor minority neighborhoods, more, more, you see it in all of them poor neighborhoods. I mean, it's just as bad in poor white neighborhoods, but it's a lot more, you know, it's, it's taken up another notch in poor black neighborhoods yeah. where, um, you know, a brutal, a brutal, a brutal system of authoritarianism and regulation and rules. You know, you can't walk five blocks without, you know, <laughs> you know, being monitored or breaking a rule or, you know, and then there's an uneven just application of rules. And then once the rule, once, once you, once you are, you know, uh, once you are subjected to all these rules, then of course you have less less uh, uh, less ability the legal system, and so um, you know I think I was more I, I'm always more surprised at what happened than the kind of the, the protest and the, and some and then some of the, the looting that occurred doesn't happen more often. That's not me it's not me advocating for it. I'm just surprised it doesn't happen more often because I un I understand the anger and I've hmm. seen the anger and it's palatable. Um, I think. <laughs> what 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 can what kind of got frustrating is the degree to which you know it it became about you know General Electric or Coca Cola um, mm -hmm. jumping onto the movement to do symbolic messages without any changes you know um, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna you know I think I wrote at the time when it just happened like unfortunately with the Black Lives Matter uh, movement is going to be basically turned into some sort of empty empty um, symbolic gesture. Mm -hmm. that um you know um uh, franchises can 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 jam on their can glob on to to basically do symbolic uh symbolic um gesticulations with no real policy change mm -hmm. and i'm afraid that's kind of what's happened and so in that sense you know the degree to which it's been used as almost um by by a lot of front row members to you know as, as as i always you know it's kind of the the plastic wristband of um the modern day um form of um of penance which is you know <coughs> um or indulge indulgences which is like look you know i i got a black life matter sticker on me therefore i can't possibly uh, it's my get out of privilege free card and therefore i i don't have to address any of the things that i'm doing mm -hmm. you know, i'm still living in my gated community still living in my um you know you know, I always say that, um, you know, if for all these people who, who who talk a good good game, their their personal lives are not at all impacted by um, any of these things that go on. They they're talking from gated communities and closed colleges where nobody there's no risk that you know, <laughs> yeah. You know, if if, uh, if if any of the people I spent my time with were, were to walk onto a college campus, they would be arrested. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think. It was it, it was used in many cases. Unfortunately, um, that doesn't that doesn't mean it wasn't you know a noble movement. It doesn't mean that a lot of what came out of it wasn't what you know what. And and I think a lot of the, the a lot of the anger you saw was organic. It wasn't you know uh, what the right says it was it was it was done by you know the activist class. No, no, I mean it was it was organic. It was it was a real justified anger. And um and but it but it did get channeled into ways that benefited the front row um, with mm -hmm. with little change for the back row yeah yeah um again so many things to to go through i'd be interested in um maybe thinking a little bit more about you know you mentioned a little bit earlier about how uh one of the key problems with the activist left or you know whatever you know class of activists in any you know uh political movement 
you know, is coming from this place of being in front row America and being very not a part of back row America, not a part of the, the people that they're claiming to represent. Um, they're living in different communities. They're working in different communities. They're coming from a whole different sort of cultural background. And, um, you know, the, uh, I know that, you know, for the ASP, I think this is definitely uh, an important and interesting question for a lot of those here present is, you know, we are uh, primarily, I mean, the, we're gathering right now on Zoom, you know, the, the primary way that a lot of people are communicating um, in the ASP is on Facebook, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's not a, and, and this is true, not just of, of the ASP, I think this is very true of, you know, both Republican and Democratic politics, that a lot of these discussions, a lot of these forums are taking place, you know, online, on Twitter, you know, they're taking place through like the headlines of Fox or CNN or whatever. We're just, there's, uh, and in those digital spaces, it's very easy for all, you know, front row people of a particular mindset to come together and kind of believe that they're in a community, believe that they have a sense of, uh, you know, um, you know, solidarity and clarity about the world that is, you know, just totally divided from a lot of what you're describing. And so, you know, what, what is it that's needed to, um, if anything, I mean, you, you mentioned that maybe it's just not possible to have a, a class that, you know, a, a political party that can bring together both, you know, educated and uneducated people. But if, if that were to happen, you know, if, if you were to get that non-voting uh, political group, engaged in any kind of politics what would it be that you know how, how would that happen how would they be engaged i mean i think <clears throat> i think you know um you're almost a better person than me than answer because because in some senses i would say you know you, you talk talk to people who work in the community mm -hmm. um, you know like the catholic workers associations mm -hmm. talk to um you know, a, it's anathema on the left to do it but talk, you know the people who actually spend their lives in these communities not 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 for brownie points, um, but because that's what they really do. You know, priests, um, especially especially um, uh, in the in the in the more, like the Franciscans. You know, um, mm -hmm. um, who actually go into these communities and spend time there. Um, police, um, you know, who actually spend time in these communities. Um, and I think, you know, you really have to. You have to be part of these communities, not in a um, kind of you know check the box way, but really you know you know, you, and you got to do it because you want to do it, not because you know you're doing it to, to build your resume. You got to you know you got to you got to kind of <laughs> you got to you got to mud wrestle, and um, you know um, that means um, you know uh, some of the most um, insightful people I met, and some of the people um, also often most impressive people in terms of like. One of the things I never wrote about in my book is the people who are actually quote the happiest. It's kind of the people who who operate in in, in both worlds, which is mm -hmm. the kind of front row people who are spending time in the back row um, and doing small moments of good, like community college teachers. Um, you know, some of the one of the you know most insightful and, and and most quote happiest people I've met were people like you know who work at I think it was community college of El Paso, who was kind of you know if, if anybody here knows. If you work in a, like a smaller community college or a smaller state school, you're often a social, social worker as much as anything. Mm -hmm. And that sort of social work, um, you know, and just really getting, just, just knowing, you know, not getting too detached from the community. But then, you know, again, almost all the history of politics is, it is, it is, it is run by the front row. I mean, you know, the activist class runs politics and that's always been true of history. And that's not necessarily bad. You know, I mean, it's not the end of the world, but it, it's knowing your, it's knowing the gap, knowing the gap between you and the people you claim to represent um, and, and, and being, being open-minded enough to really listen to them and say, you know, how, how are we going to change things? You know, uh, how am I going to bring you into this process? How, how can I properly represent you in a way that, uh, you know, um, and, and I think, you know, no matter how well intended you are, um, people get caught up in, you know, and um, wanting to make money out of this stuff, you know, so it's, yeah. you always, you always end up siding, it, it, people always drift to siding with policies that benefit them personally <laughs> mm -hmm. you know it's very rare that someone goes and you know you know that they rarely and, and so or, or suffers the consequence of the of, of the policies they advocate for and you know it's very easy if you live in a gated community you know on the left 
to, to advocate or on the right to advocate certain policies uh, if they're not going to impact you. Um, it's very, it's very, it's much indifferent if you live in the community itself. Um, you know, if, you know, when when you when your when your actual, you know, your flesh is on the line as much as anybody else. So I, I'm not so sure. You know, we become too DC and New York City, you know, centric. Um, in terms of the, the journalists, the media, the kind of front row, um, the academic, even, you know, even within, you know, a lot of people will say, well, you know, what do you mean? I'm, I'm, I live in, um, you know, I live in, um, uh, I live in Jersey, like, you know, well, you probably live in Princeton or, you know, I, I live in, you know, I, I live in Oklahoma. Well, I'm going to guess you live at probably a, a university town in a university neighborhood next to a university in Oklahoma. Um, but, you know, it, it, do, or I live in Milwaukee. It's like, well, do you, do you live in North Side? <laughs> you know, or, 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 or do you live in that part of Milwaukee where they have all the Basoak restaurants, fine dining? And uh -huh. you know, so I, I think it, it, it's just, you just you got to get, you got to get your hands dirty. Mm -hmm. So I'm hearing you say, uh, you know, that perhaps there's a need among activists to sort of be uh, those who are politically engaged and trying to work for, uh, for social justice, for a better world, to really sort of be detached from that careerism, that, you know, uh, advancing their own social status, and maybe a lot more attached to those things you mentioned earlier, to place, to family, to, um, to, to faith, to, to these sorts of uh, things is that a maybe something that people can sort of try to uh, what what practices would would that entail? I mean, I guess maybe following your own footsteps. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think you know the I think you have to. You sometimes it pushes you into you know again. This is a, a more a more philosophical question. I can't necessarily answer, but um, you know, if you're in a political party and and you and you want to represent quote the working class mm -hmm. and you find that they disagree with you in aggregate what do you do <laughs> like you know do you do you continue to advocate for a position if it's not you know you have to make you have to make these pragmatic choices you know do you push mm -hmm. for x even though you know but i mean i think at a sheerly pragmatic level of getting elected you know um yeah i, I think the new york city mayor election is a really good illustration of the mm -hmm. point um, you, you got you you know people vote for people who are like them mm. not just not just in looks but in 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 culture and yeah. attitude you know um you know if, if you look at if you look at there was eight candidates you know and and you see who did well where you know and i knew new york city like literally block by block and you know the 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 resume builder did well with the resume builders you know the yeah. the the black former cop who kind of came from nothing did well with you know <laughs> the blacks who generally came from nothing you know and uh and you you get these really kind of you know you get these kind of one of the things that i i'll always disagree with um in the discussion is i really do think politics is about culture but not in the way we talk about it. it's not about cultural symbolic issues those are those are extraordinarily important and so it's not necessarily about, you know, so people back in this, I don't even remember in 2016, there was a big economic anxiety versus racism and all that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've always said they got the conversation wrong. Politics is about economic anxiety, but it's about people being anxious that all we ever talk about is economics. You know, there is much more going on, you know, there, you know, economics what you need to do economically for people is not get in your way you need to help them i mean you need to give them real results um mm -hmm. you know you need to give them health care you, you need to give them you know um a proper a proper social social safety net mm -hmm. but after that it's all cultural issues and um you got you got to be people are not going to vote for someone who's not who doesn't get them you mm -hmm. know i mean trump is a perfect example of people will say well what do you mean the they voted for Trump, but Trump was like them. I mean, he was like, uh -huh. you know, he got them and they got him. You know, there's this misunderstanding that there's this misunderstanding of, of a lot of the working class and poor that they somehow hate rich people. No, <laughs> what, what they do, what they don't want, I mean, they don't, they, they, they admire rich people who they can imagine. They can, they can imagine that that could be them if they played their cards right. Mm -hmm. You know, they can aspire to that. 
you know, Trump made big buildings. If they, you know, if they play their cards right, they could be making big buildings too. Um, working at a university teaching law students, I mean, that's not even like, there's no, that's not even in their aspirational set. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, so you need politicians who, who, who are, they can aspire to and inspire and inspire them. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that only means being a party who's kind of like the, like the people you want to get, well, you got to be like them. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I want to go back to something you, know, you said earlier about, uh, you know, you, you were talking about bureaucracy and about how that's kind of, uh, uh, much hated, you know, uh, in back row America, and and we deal with a lot of bureaucracy. I mean, everyone deals with it, but um, you know, for some of us, uh, we can we can kind of muddle our way through and and get what we need out of it. But a lot of people deal with bureaucracy and just get beaten over the head uh, time and time again. And so, um, you know, obviously, a key sort of core value in in a, the American Solidarity Party is uh, subsidiarity and. Um, you know, we talk about the idea of distributism, of widespread ownership, of an ownership economy. Um, you know, do you have any experiences um, or reflections on, you know, the what uh, what the role of ownership is? You know, in you, you mentioned like the the important role of you know a social safety network of um, you know Medicare for all and such, and, and I value those as important goals, um, but. You know, ownership is you know more so it goes beyond maybe just like that social safety network. And I'm curious if there's any ways in which you've seen that. Yeah, reflected. I mean, you know, people, you know, so I get I I'm known as McDonald's guys for a lot of people uh -huh. talk about the you know uh, the importance of McDonald's of these communities as community centers. And what I what what, what I tend to what, what the reason I highlight McDonald's is um, it. McDonald's to me highlight the. I find all this community in McDonald's. They're 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 community centers. They're often town centers. And I, I don't mean that you know, that's a, that's kind of a damning statement. Um, it's 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 also illustrative. It's illustrated that how people want how much people want community, but it also illustrates how badly communities have fallen apart. They've fallen apart so much that people are making community in McDonald's. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that that's frustrating about you know when i hear we talk about work and dignity of work and things like that mm -hmm. um you know i wrote a, I wrote a piece called dignity endure which is that's how a lot of people approach work as something they have to endure um they, they don't buy the careerism that i think a lot of we in the front row do but there is there that, that doesn't mean that you can't have dignity work it's the type of work they have and that and that that type of work is where they have ownership now, and that's craftsmanship mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. that's dignified work um where the problem with, you know, people can find, you know, people can take very much, and, and I've met lots of people who take great, great pride in the work they do at Walmart, great pride in the work they do, because people like to be good at what they do, um, no matter the situation. They take great pride in, in, in the work at McDonald's. The problem, though, is there's a huge difference. The ownership, you know, you're work, you're working for the, some distant ownership who who's basically some you know profiteering center way 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 away mm -hmm. in New York City. Um, that's very different type of work than if you're working for you know a local entity that mm -hmm. you have ownership stake in, and that you you feel like you're really adding you're adding value in. You know, the, the overwhelming theme of my you know, you know I said if I had to give a bumper sticker for my book. You know the take-home bump, political bumper sticker is that everybody wants to feel a valued member of something larger than themselves. Mm. They want to feel, you know, that can be from the guy who's really, you know, the person that can be at the role as as a as a as a mother or a father. That can be, you know, an extended family. That can be, uh, you know, a guy on the pickup softball team who's really important. I mean, but people you need, or that can be a congregant. Um, but people really need to feel a valued member of something larger than themselves, um, and 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 and, that, and that's true of work too. Um, and so that that's much harder when you have this distant ownership sense, where you know um, where they don't feel like an they're, they're not they don't feel like an owner of 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 you know of uh, of uh, they don't feel like they they own something that mm -hmm. that they're you know that they feel like they're just you know a cog in the wheel as it were and. Yeah. Um, and I think it, you know, people people naturally take pride 
and want to do the best they can. I think that's uni universal. Um, you have to, you, we, we have, we've made it very hard, you know, very hard. We've made it very, our political system has made it very hard to build dignified lives. Mm -hmm. It's not conducive to that. It's not conducive to the creation of communities. It's not con creation to the con conducive to the creation of kind of small ownership ventures because it's so, it's so dehumanizing and, and so, and so monopolistic. Um, and it really, really has, you know, created a class of people who, who, who really do feel like they're kind of just, you know, atoms floating in the wind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, uh, I, I read that piece, Dignity to Endure, and I, I'd recommend it to anyone listening. And it kind of, you know, obviously, like you mentioned, you know, there's this sort of sentimental way that, you know, manual labor, the working class is uh, depicted many times. And, um, you know, I, I noted in reading your piece, you were kind of talking about the ways in which uh, a lot of times it is undignified. It's not, you know, that manual labor isn't dignified. And I, I was noting the difference, you know, I work in construction. And so uh, I, I, you know, that, you know, whatever other, you know, there's, there's certainly issues about what we're building, where we're building it, but um, you know, there is craftsmanship there and there's mm -hmm. definitely dignity in, in that work. And, you know, I think I experienced that and I, I know my coworkers have definitely a strong sense of, you know, of, of being skilled and of having this, this ability to, to craft, to build, you know, and, and taking pride in like a job well done. Um, but so many jobs of manual labor, uh, and this is for a small business, mind you, this is a small Amish business I work for. Um, so many jobs of that, that manual labor, like you said, aren't for that, uh, you know, are for these large corporations are, um, you know, definitely very, uh, I mean, really often kind of ruled by the machines that you're using or, you know, things like that. Um, what are some, you know, uh, ex, you know, examples you mentioned, you did mention people feeling dignified work, like being proud of the work they do, you know, say at McDonald's or at, at Walmart or something like that. So, you know, what are, what, what makes, uh, what makes for dignified work, you know, in, in your experience? Well, I think, you know, I think the ultimate feeling is, you know, there, there's an ethos of one, of one of the big corrupting things that Wall Street has done, my old industry has done, and the intellectual class has done is to, um, is to kind of glamorize the, I call it the intellectual grift, mm -hmm. which is, you know, the private equity companies or, you know, this idea of you come into a community, you 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 make money in in kind of shady ways and then you're proud of it because it's really smart like you use some sort of you know you strip you, you take over a company you um with a leverage buyout you strip its assets you resell it and you high five your friends you destroy jobs you move jobs to mexico you move jobs to indonesia whatever mm -hmm. um money and, you, and you extract profit and you high find you you sit around and when in, in lower manhattan high fiving your friends because look at the clever thing you did um that's not an honest day's work. That's mm -hmm. not what people view as an honest day's work, but yet we kind of, and we in the front row kind of, you know, there's a large percentage of people we've made that legal and it's celebrated, uh, mm -hmm. you know, with, within certain circles. And I think I call that the intellectual grift. And I think there's a sense of people don't mind working if they feel like it's being rewarded. You know, honest day's work is being rewarded honestly. It's mm -hmm. when people are, when they feel very much like other people are getting ahead by cheating. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're, doing, you're doing your job, working real hard at McDonald's, um, taking pride in what you do. And then someone, so, you know, someone over, someone, <laughs> someone buys out the McDonald's and, mm -hmm. and replaces, you know, uh, the kiosk with teller machines and then walks away with like, you know, a big profit or something, you know, mm -hmm. the, the sense of being kind of on the short end of a, of a scam. Yeah. Um, and I think we've made so many jobs make people feel like they're on the short end of a scam um, where, you know, where, where, you know, uh, you, where people aren't playing by the rules, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, if you're, if you play by the rules and that's what you're proud of, and then other people are cheating or not playing by the rules and getting rewarded a lot more. that's, that's really hard to, that, that really, you know, that, that hurts. Um, you know, so I think, I think I, I tend to, to the degree I have a political 
you know, I'm much more for localism in the sense that, um, you know, you need, you need local ownership. You, you need that small com construction company, but more and more that's been dismantled and replaced by the big conglomerate, you know, <laughs> who, who, who just kind of steamrolls everybody else because they can, you know, they quite honestly, because they, they can pay more lawyers to basically skirt more, skirt, skirt more rules. Yeah. As we're finishing up our time here, I'd uh, like to close with a question, um, and we have only about five more minutes here, of, um, you know, you've been in a lot of these back row communities, you've seen uh, both the, the pain in them, and then also, you know, you have mentioned these experiences of people finding community, even if it's, you know, in whatever's left of their sort of, uh, you know, deindustrialized, burnt out, you know, flyover town. Um, that's, that's, you know, been left behind. So I'm wondering, you know, people often think when they think political action, political organizing, you know, knocking on, you know, just a bunch of doors, getting people to vote or handing out flyers or maybe posting online about it. Um, I think that's, that's a lot of what people think of. Are there any models that are different than that? Any sort of places and institutions, ways of organizing, maybe, you know, maybe for, you know, politics in terms of, uh, you know, big elections, maybe just for, you know, uh, politics on a more local sense, you know, in, in building the kind of community that can engage politically that you've seen that could be valuable models for people to learn more about, to, to engage in, to inspire people. Yeah. I mean, I think, again, I can't, I can't, um, de-emphasize enough the importance of getting out and talking to people. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, but, but, but again, you know, doing it in a really um, genuine way, um, you know, it, it's kind of like, you know, it was interesting that you say you're, you're part of the Catholic workers movement. You, are you in a Catholic workers house as well? Right yeah. Now? Yeah. We live here in a, you know, a poor part of town. I mean, it's uh, the overlap between where I went in Catholic worker house was pretty, was pretty high, <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> you know? Um, so that model of being in, being in a place mm -hmm. that, but you know that really needs it yeah. and, and spending and spending time I mean you know spending time there like you know yeah. you know I, I didn't you know when I was on the road I slept in I slept in my car in Walmarts or I, yeah. I slept in hotels that charge by the hour or a month you know um, not by not by the day <laughs> yeah you know um, and off and, and at nights when I was writing up my notes I spent my four hours a night in a McDonald's, you know, mm -hmm. sitting at a table. You know, that was often for three weeks at a time, two weeks at a time. When I quote wasn't working, those are the moments I learned the most. Mm. When you know, at two in the morning, someone knocked on my door in the in the in the cheap motel, staying in, had an emergency, and I had to help them. Yeah. Um, or you know, as you know, in your house, there's a skirmish out front, and you go out and see what's happening, and you end mm. up talking to someone for you know whatever period of time or. Or, 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 or the, the people who use McDonald's as basically a homeless shelter, you know, who come sit with me at the end of the week and just sat and talked, you know, those are the moments where I feel like um, you kind of, where you learn the most. Um, and you got to spend the time, you know, I mean, it's like, mm -hmm. it, it's almost like if you're, if you're looking, if you're looking to get politics, if you, if you just go in a bar or, you know, a working class hey hey working class people what do you think about politics <laughs> mm -hmm. you know that's that's not gonna you know if, 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 there are times i used to try that i mean i'd be sitting at a bar and going hey what do you think about and you know, that, that never not, nothing ever came of that like it's just letting things letting things happen natural and letting the conversation and, and, and listening and le letting people come to you as a, as opposed to you come to them and that, that just takes time you know i mean yeah. and, and, and in lieu of that you know, if you can't do that yourself, you know, use sources, again, people who spend their life in these neighborhoods. Um, and, um, you know, often what I found the way I operate in the neighborhood was I found there are people who are very kind of central, central players in the community, kind of hmm. people who have reputations and you got to win them over, hmm. you know, um, you know, you got to find the, pe the, the you got to find the, the minister who a lot of people respect. You got to find the you know, for, for what I did, sometimes a drug dealer that, you know, that yeah. was, you know, that was essential and had a lot of people, people listen to and, and, and just really get them to appreciate that you're genuine and that you really have their best interests at heart. And mm -hmm. that's, that's just a matter of time. All right. Well, 
thank you so much, Chris, for all those great insights. And uh, there's a lot more you've written for um, the American uh, Compass and for um, a number. You've got a, a bunch of stuff in The Guardian. You have your book, Dignity. I'd really, for those interested in um, delving more into some of these insights that you've discussed, I'd really encourage people to check out your work. And is there anything else you'd like to uh, suggest? Um, oh, no, that, that's, that's, that's fantastic. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for your time. All right. Bless you and have a great night.